Guys. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing well. How are you? Okay. Submitting students. I think um, we'll give it another minute. Um, so just some administrative stuff before um, where we start, like while I'm waiting for everybody to join up. Um, we uh, we have a test coming up on, this test was originally going to be on um, uh, Thursday, but now it's going to be on Monday, okay? Um, I think what I'm going to do for the test is we'll start the test at 10 a.m. on Monday, okay? So it would have been like when our class would have been, and we're going to go from 10 a.m. Monday to 10 a.m. Tuesday. So we won't have a class on Monday because that'll be for our test, okay? And But we will have a class on Tuesday. So we'll pick up on Tuesday with our classes, right? So today um, we're gonna do chapter 9.2. Tomorrow we'll do 9.3. We would have done that on Monday, but tomorrow we'll do 9.3. And then on Tuesday we'll pick up um, with the rest of chapter nine. Um, and then we'll have some time, I think, on Thursday of next week to do some review for final exam stuff. Um, Although uh, we'll talk about what that's gonna look like um, probably over the next couple of days because we're still kind of ironing it out with um, the course coordinators. And um, I'll let you guys know as soon as we kind of come to a, um, an agreement about it. We're kind of getting there, we're, we're about there. It's um, a little bit different uh, this year because obviously we're at home and we're kind of doing things differently than we would normally. Um, so thank you for your patience and understanding about uh, how the final is gonna be. Most likely our final exam is gonna be on um, maybe like the Tuesday of um, final exam week, okay? Um, I think probably I'll end up setting it up like we have um, our other exams where it's like four o'clock, maybe I'll start at four o'clock on Monday to go to like four o'clock on, on Tuesday. Um, and then uh, that way you guys will have, you know, a 24 hour window to take the final exam, that's for our final. So that would be um, June, uh, mostly June 23rd, okay? But it'll probably start on the afternoon of the 22nd. Um, Anyway, but we'll uh, we'll confirm all that when we when we go. So today, what I'm also going to do is I'll put up an announcement, um, clarifying about the midterm exam that we have coming up. Um, that it's going to be on Monday. Also, our homework. By the way, I changed the due date for the homework, so it'll, it's reflected. It'll be due on Monday instead of on um, instead of on Thursday. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, depending on how we do with time today, if we finish um, with some extra time, if you guys have questions on the homework you want to ask me about at the end of class, um, I'll stop the recording and then um, I'll answer any questions about um, homework problems that you might have, depending on how we're doing on time. We, um, <clears throat> we may end up having some time to do that today. Okay. All right, so with that said, um, let's go ahead and get started. So this is, um, we're, gonna, we're moving on to um, chapter 9.2. 9.2, okay. And chapter 9.2 is um, what we call two sample inferences. And what this means is that um, our hypothesis test, hang on, let me this down here. Um, our hypothesis test looks something like this. So we're gonna test our null hypothesis, right? That I have a sample, um, a mean from sample X and a mean from sample Y. So X and Y are both random variables, right? And my hypothesis is that the means of these two samples are the same, okay? And then my alternate alternative hypothesis is they're either one's greater than the other or they're just not equal to each other. We're gonna go through all the different um, ideas on that. But basically it's kind of like, you can imagine if I've got a couple different distributions. So if I've got my mean for X, okay, for example, I've got this random variable X and say I have a mean, I'm gonna write it like this. I've got a mean for Y. Okay, these two different random variables. And what I wanna do is I wanna compare these two mean values. Okay, what are these two mean values? And are they statistically significantly the same 
or is one greater than the other, or are they just statistically significantly not equal to each other? Okay, and I want to say statistically significantly not equal to each other because it's really unlikely that they're going to be exactly equal to each other, and we want to set our significance level in order to measure these things. Okay, so this is kind of what we're talking about. We're going to compare two means, okay, from two different random variables. So let's talk about it. Um, I'll write it, start writing it down in terms of words too, so we can have it. Okay, so we're going to hey, say we're going to compare. Comparing the means of two, let's see if I can raise this up a little bit, two different samples. This is like our random variables x and y. As you can imagine, I've got x1, x2, and so on, all the way up to x sub n. Okay, this is my random variable. x and all of the samples that happen within my random variable x x of one x of two x of three all the way up to x of n i've got n of these our sample size for x okay now i'm also going to compare it with i've got my y1 y2 y3 y all the way up to y sub m okay this is from our random variable Y, and we've got M is our sample size. Now M and N can be equal to each other, but we want to leave it open that they're different. Okay, and these could be things like, you know, within the same experimental set, I'm asking two different questions, and I want to be able to compare whether or not there's a difference between the results of these two different questions that I'm asking, okay? Often maybe I'm even, maybe I'm using the same um, subjects or the same people in these different experiments, but I'm conducting different parameters. Okay, or I just have two completely different um, subject groups, right? So this um, one of these could be people who have a hearing impairment, and one of these could be people who are the same age but who don't have a hearing impairment. Okay, and I want to be able to test, say, a given parameter on an experiment and see if that parameter is affected by a loss of hearing or not. Okay, so I've got two different groups, and I want to be able to compare the means for there. Okay, so <clears throat> there are two different samples. We've got n and M in terms of our sample size. N and M could be equal, but they might be different. Often they're gonna be different size. Okay, so our data, okay, the data themselves can be a continuous, from a continuous probability density function, right? So most likely it's going to be a normal distribution, but it could be a continuous probability density function, or it could be binomial, right? We're asking a question. Um, can you hear this tone, yes or no, right? So they're, right, one is hearing impaired, one's not. Can you hear this tone, yes or no, for example? Okay, so it could be this. One of the things that we're talking about, though, is we want to look at X and Y. We want to have enough samples that we can assume that the underlying data are going to be normally distributed. So we're going to assume that our X and Y are random variables for these two different, you know, sample sets are going to be normally distributed and they have a mean mu sub X for my X and mu sub Y for my Y, okay? We need to be able to think about the variances of these two different distributions, right? So just a little bit there. Okay, good. So we need to be able to think about the variances, right? How do the variances relate to each other? My variance of x, my variance of my y distribution, okay? So we'll talk about it in terms of standard deviation and variance. Okay, so let's take a look at what's going to happen with our standard deviations. There's two different possibilities. Possibility one is that the standard deviation of my x distribution is equal to my standard deviation of my y, okay? So we would say this is equal um, variances. I'm writing this as standard deviation, even though I'm saying variance. And this is a normal distribution. Okay. My second possibility I have to take into account is if their variances or their standard deviations are different. Okay, how am I gonna handle that? Okay, two different cases, I'm gonna group these together. These are unequal. unequal variances. Okay. All right. So we're going to deal with um, case one first, and then we'll talk about case two. Okay. You guys 
have this here first before I um, turn the page. Uh, one second. I need to copy it down. Got it. Okay. So we're going to deal with case number one, okay, which is our first case, which is that we're going to assume that the variances are equal. We'll talk about like some rules of thumb. How do we tell if they're equal? We could do our chi-squared test to see if there's a difference between the variances, right? That's actually where you would use your chi-squared test to see if your variances are statistically significantly different from each other. If they're if they test by a chi-squared test as different from each other, then you would use case two, okay? If they test statistically significantly the same, okay, then I would use case number one, okay? So if they're the same, let's talk about this. I'm going to use what we call Old variance okay so what that means is right I know I'm talking I wrote it as a population variance here but often remember we don't know what the population variance is we just have our data set which gives us our sample variance okay but the um, subscript of a P means we're talking about a pooled variance so I'm taking my data, right? I'm assuming that the variance, that the distributions have the same shape, okay, between these two. So if I want to compare these two means, right, and I say that the variances are the same, that means that their bell-shaped curves, curves are roughly, you know, the same type of a shape. The, the means may be different, okay, but they're both kind of just as peaky or as flat as each other, okay? So we're going to pull both of these here. So my pooled formula for my variance is n minus 1, for x, so I've got my sample variance for my x distribution and the degrees of freedom for my um, x. Oops, that's m minus 1, s of y squared. So I'm doing the same thing. I've got my sample variance for my y variable, and this is my degrees of freedom for my y. This is a m minus 1, the ink ran together. And then I'm going to need to normalize it. Right, My total degrees of freedom, I'm adding up n plus m minus 2. Okay, this is my pooled sample variance. Okay, and we'd say that this is an unbiased estimator of the common variance sigma squared. Okay, so we say the common population variance sigma squared. And this is we do this when um, this means that the population variance is unknown. So we're going to use our t-test. Okay, we're using our sample variance as an unbiased estimator, right? We have to normalize by the degrees of freedom in order to calculate the unbiased portion of our variance here. Okay. So when you guys have this written down, I think that this is actually on your formula sheet too. Yeah. Um, I have my formula sheet on hand here. Um, I think that the pooled variance um, is on your formula sheet. I thought I had a copy. Like I know. Okay, I'm pretty sure that this is on your formula sheet. It's something that you'll want to have written down on your formula sheet if you don't have it already. Okay, so let's talk about um, if we have two random samples, okay, and I want to be able to do a t test, right, where I'm going to be comparing to the means of two um, samples together. So let's talk about what that looks like in terms of. Um, how we're doing our formulas and calculating things. Okay, so if I have two random variable samples, okay, in these two samples, they have a t distribution. And remember, our t distribution is just like our z distribution, only the tails tend to be a little bit wider, a little bit thicker. And it has, um, n plus m minus 2 degrees of freedom. Okay, so what this looks like is, right, draw this as a picture, right? I take my 
who means together, right? And this is our um, x bar minus y bar, okay? So this is our distribution of our x bar minus our y bar. So our mean for our x random variable and our mean or estimate for our y random variable. Okay, now when I wanna calculate out my test statistic for this, okay, I have to think about it like this. Uh, let me write it down here. So I'm gonna go um, T and plus M minus two, and I'm writing it as a capital T, but really we're talking about this as a small T. This is um, X bar minus Y bar minus U sub X minus Y, um, U sub Y all over our pooled, okay, our pooled sample standard deviation times one over N plus one over M in the square root, okay? So it's sim similar to kind of like what we did before in terms of we have our standard deviation divided by radical N, okay? But in this case, I've got one over N plus one over M. These are the sample sizes for my X and my Y random variables. And I've got my pooled, basically our variance. So we take the square root of our variance. Okay, this is what this number is here. So this, comes from here, okay? So we're plugging this in. Now, let's talk about what this numerator means, what we're trying to actually calculate, okay? This comes from our hypothesis test right here. So let me put this in a box because this is important when we're talking about comparing the means together, okay? So let's talk about, um, I'll do that here. Fill up a little bit. So our hypothesis test looks like this. Okay, so I'm doing X bar minus Y bar. So let's talk about in words, like what that means. So this is like seeing our observed difference between the sample means. That's what we're actually checking, right? But our hypothesis tells us, I've got my population, right? These are the population means, right? The population of my X, uh, random variables and the population of my y random variables. So this is, we've got the hypothesis that there is no difference, difference between the population means right. So this is like saying my null hypothesis is that my mean X is equal to my mean of Y, okay? If this is true, right, if my null hypothesis is true, then this portion here is equal to zero, right? That's what I'm testing on my null hypothesis. I've got my samples, right? I wanna see the difference between these two here. So I'm gonna make this assumption that when I take the difference between these two means, right, that they're centered, the mean is centered at zero, which means that there's no difference between them, okay? That they're equal to each other. So this is like saying mu sub x minus mu sub y equals zero. Okay, that's another way of writing the same hypothesis. Okay, so if our null hypothesis is true, this will be zero, okay? If our null hypothesis is not true, we're gonna talk about the three different cases, our two-tailed, our right-tailed, and our left-tailed. What do those look like here? Okay, if that's not true, okay, that's what I'm testing, okay? But my null hypothesis starts off where the two means are gonna be equal to each other. Okay, so this is our null hypothesis, and we're gonna say it's versus are three different cases for alternative hypothesis. Okay, so our first case is, <clears throat> right, that the um, difference between the two does not equal to zero, okay? Which is another way of, oh, that should be an X, Y, sorry. That's another way of saying that X is equal to Y, okay, that they're, that these two, we, our hypothesis is that they're equal, and our alternative is that they're not equal. This is two-tailed which means I'm looking at, right, I'm gonna split this up into a two-tailed case and this is a zero, okay? So that's the first case where the two means are not equal to each other. Second case of my alternate, alternate hypothesis is that my mu sub x is greater than my mu sub y. If mu sub x is greater than y, then the difference between them mu sub x minus mu sub y is greater than zero, right? It's positive. So this is going to be a right-tailed test, which is gonna look like zero, 
that's here what we're looking at right because think about it right if mu sub x is greater than mu sub y this is going to be a positive result right three minus two is a positive number okay it's our right tail test um, our third condition possibility you can imagine what it's going to be is that mu sub x is less than mu sub y which is another way of saying that mu sub x minus mu sub y is less than zero okay this is a left tailed okay and then that test ends up looking like like that okay now this is by the way our distributions for our difference in the means okay so no longer am i comparing a mean to a particular number i'm comparing one mean to another this is a really common experimental case right i've got two population groups and i need to check what's different about them, okay? Or that this experimental protocol has an effect on this group, but not on that group. And then I can make some hypothesis about how this group, the, the things that are going on with this group, right? We can be, manifest them by doing this experiment here. Okay. <clears throat> Does everybody have these here? Give you guys a second to keep writing. You're all set and ready to go. You can take out your lecture examples from chapter 9.2. We're going to start working through these. Okay. Anybody need more time on these here? All right. So chapter 9.2, um, lecture examples. Okay. <clears throat> so the question is, um, example one, do male college students drive faster than female college students, which is a mean faster speed is what we're looking at. So is there evidence at the alpha 0 0.05 level to conclude that the means are different? Okay, so we've got our male students. We've got 34 male students. The average speed is 105.5. The sample standard deviation is 20.1. Our female college students, we have 29 of them, right? The average of their speed is 90.9, and their sample of this female group is 12.2 okay. miles per hour or whatever, however we're measuring our speed, okay? So now let's go ahead and take a look. We're gonna be comparing the means of these two different groups. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to assume is I'm going to say, I'm going to make the judgment call. These are on the same order, 20 and 12. They're about the same. It's not like 20 and 200 or 20 and 120. They're about the same order. Okay, so I'm going to say that since the standard deviations are on the same order, um, uh, order of magnitude, basically, like this is 20.1 and 12.2, okay? Um, so I'm gonna make the assumption that the variances are equal, okay? We'll come back to this problem later, I think. So if the variances are equal, then I can use my pooled formula, okay? But we'll come back to that. So first I need to state my assumption because I'm gonna be using it in a minute. So let's talk about things. So we're gonna roll through like we usually do. So I'm gonna state out my hypothesis. Okay, so my hypothesis states, my null hypothesis says that my mean for the male students, and I know this was X and Y, but I'm just gonna call it X and um, M and F, and my mean for the female students is equal to zero. So let's write this as my mean equals mean. Okay, that's my null hypothesis versus, right? So if I look at it, um, the means are different. So when you hear in the, word problem it says are they different that means we're talking about a two-tailed test one we didn't say <coughs> is this one faster than the other which would be a one-tailed test or is this one slower than the other which would be a one-tailed test we're just saying are they different so now i'm going to say the mu m minus mu f does not equal to zero or i can say that mu m is not equal to mu z okay i'm just writing these in two different ways and both are the same okay so however you feel comfortable writing it is totally fine so that's our hypothesis. Now I'm going to calculate out my test statistic. Okay. So my test statistic, let's see. So my t equals x bar minus y bar minus mu sub x minus mu sub y. I'm going to write down the whole formula and then we'll take out the parts that we don't need. S sub e times radical 1 over n plus 1 over m. Okay. Um, watch out, by the way, for your um, order of operations. I noticed when I was grading the quiz, when you guys were <laughs> doing problems where you had like to calculate a z statistic, say for example, and you have the sigma over radical n in the denominator, 
Um, I think that um, your calculators betrayed you when you did it because like you probably look like all your calculations and your setup were correct. Okay, but some of you, um, it looks like maybe you just typed it into your calculator and you didn't put parentheses around the denominator. Okay, so make sure you're, you can just go overboard in the parentheses, it won't, won't hurt you. If you have parentheses around this, then it'll take care of, I need to divide these two terms first and then divide them into the numerator because otherwise it's going to do things not what you expect. And then you got values that um, were incorrect, but I think it's because of the order of operations. <clears throat> okay, so let's fill things in. Oh, but first I need to calculate out my S sub P. So my pooled um, variance, okay, I'm going to calculate my variance first, and then we'll take the square root. So my variance n minus 1, s of x squared, plus m minus 1, s of y squared, over n plus m minus 2. Okay, and then if I want to calculate my p, I'm going to take the square root of it, square root of it to get my standard deviation. So let's go ahead and plug this in to get this first so we can plug it into the t statistic. So my S of P is going to be equal to 34 minus 1 times 20.1 squared plus 29 minus 1 times 12.2 squared all over 34 plus 29 minus 2. Sorry, you can't see that. Okay, take the square root. Okay, multiply it out. When I did this, I got um, 16.94. Um, also, don't uh, don't be so quick to round. Okay, maybe keep things out. Um, you know, a couple of decimal places if you want to round at the very end. But typically, for things like probabilities, we go out to four decimal places. Okay, so um, but for things like this, I'll take two. Right. Um, so keep that in mind. If you round it too much, you're going to carry through rounding errors into your problem. All right. So let's plug this in into our t statistic. Okay. So t equals. I'm going to start putting in these values. So I'm putting in my x bar and y bar. So this is 105.5 minus 90.9 minus, this is my null hypothesis that the two population means are equal to each other. Okay. All over my S of P, 16.94, times radical 1 over 34 plus 1 over 29. 29. Okay, when I calculate this out, my key statistic is equal to 3.4. I'm going to need that, right, my test statistic, okay? So far, so good. I'm going to turn the page because we've got to calculate our critical value. I guess I'll have that before I turn the page. Okay, All right, so this is example one, and now I need to calculate my critical value. Okay, so my critical value now, this is a two-tailed test, which means I need to take my alpha and divide it by two because I'm splitting that alpha up into the two different tails of my um, normal distribution. So alpha over two is equal to 0 0.05 divided by two, 0 0.025. Okay, so I look this up on my table, right? So I've got my degrees of freedom equal to 34 plus 29 minus two, okay? which is gonna give me a degree of freedom equal to 61. So I'm gonna look up the 61 line on my T table, right? And for my probability, right, my alpha equals 0 0.025, and I find T 0 0.025 comma 61, my degrees of freedom, equal to plus or minus 1.99, okay? Plus or minus because it's two-tailed, remember? So let's just draw this quick picture here. All right, so this is minus 1.99, this is positive 1.99. This defines our critical region here. Okay. So this region, the area under this curve is 0 0.025. The area under this curve is 0 0.025 from here to here. Okay. That's how we think about it. All right. So this is our critical region. So we're going to look, we're going to compare our test statistic. Sorry, our test statistic with our critical value and see where we're at. I'm going to get a feeling for it already. Okay. So now, let's see. For our decision. Okay, so our test statistic was um, 3.417. So 3.417 is like right here, 3.417. That's my test statistic. Okay, which means we're, you know, smack right in the middle of our um, critical region, which is good. So we're going to say our test statistic 
which is 3.417, is greater than our positive critical value, which was positive 1.99. Okay, therefore, I have to state my final conclusion. I have to reject the null hypothesis, okay, based on the evidence, okay? So we can say this, um, based on the evidence, male drivers have a significantly different, let's say faster um, <coughs> speed, driving speed. with our female group. Okay, so our hypothesis was that the means of these two different sample groups were the same. Okay, but we've just showed, right, based on the comparison of our critical value and our test statistic, that that's not true. We're going to reject that hypothesis that the means are the same. Okay, but when we assume that the means are the same, right, in my calculation of my test statistic, right here, this is my mu of x minus mu of, mu of y, okay? That means that the difference between those two is equal to zero. So in my test statistic, I'm assuming that the null hypothesis is true, but it's coming out well within our critical region, which says these are actually significantly different, okay? So we're comparing two means now, two sample means. Anybody need more time to keep writing on this one? Or something? Okay. That was case one, when the population variances were the same. Okay. So we're going to talk about case two. Okay, when the population variances are not equal, okay, how do we need to handle it? So we've got two independent samples, random variables, from two normal distributions, okay, but their variances aren't the same. So that's like saying, right, I've got, this is my mu sub x, and then I'm going to really exaggerate it. U sub y. Okay. So this one's a little bit peakier than this one. So our variances, that's how it would look different. If they're the same, right, they're going to have the same basic shape, even though their means are in different spots. Okay. But here you can see this is a little flatter than that one, just as an example. What it kind of looks like. All right. <clears throat> so when we do this, right, we're assuming our data follows approximately a normal distribution. Okay, which allows us to do um, this. We're gonna calculate out our T statistic a little bit differently. So I've got my difference in my samples minus my null hypothesis, right, that this population means are different, all over I've got the variance of my x divided by the quantity, the variance of the y divided by the quantity, and I take the square root of, of all of those. So I, it's like we're adding them together, but I have to normalize it by its own quantity. Okay, so this is the difference in the means, this is our hypothesis, okay, and these are the um, variances. Well, we're taking the square root, so it becomes like um, a modified standard deviation. Okay. <clears throat> box around that. Okay, now what happens when we calculate the T, I need the degrees of freedom. So I need to think about how I'm going to calculate my degrees of freedom. If I can't pull them, I have to have a, a different way of doing it. I'm going to show you two different ways. Um, both are acceptable, but um, I need to show you both just so that you can get a feeling for it. So our degrees of freedom. So it's degrees of freedom is going to be R equals Okay, R equals, let's write it like this. Let me write it down and then we'll talk about it. <clears throat> okay, 
It's kind of a monster. I'm going to give you the simplified version. You're going to roll your eyes. All right. So our degrees of freedom, let's write down what this is. R is actually, it looks like this. This is um, rho. Okay. And this follows chi squared distribution. It follows the chi squared distribution because look what we're doing. We're comparing the variances between our different populations, right? So I'm, I'm basically pulling them together. I've got a pooled variance, right? Divided by the weight of each individual one. So I'm, I have my individual variances and I've got my pooled variance and I need to kind of, you know, weight it out. So this is what's going to give us our degrees, degrees of freedom. But essentially it's a ratio, okay, of our variances, right? Which is why it follows the chi-squared distribution. So um, R depends on a ratio of variances, okay? So you can think of it as theta, right? We're talking about a ratio of our population variances, okay? But we're using our sample variances as estimates for it, okay? Let me write that down, what this means. <clears throat> So we don't know what the population variances are, sigma x and sigma y squared. When they're unknown, we can estimate theta as being just a ratio of our variances. Okay, so <clears throat> we don't have a theta in here. Okay, but you can see that I'm actually right. This is our chi-squared distribution here, where I have a ratio of the two variances. Okay, but if I don't know what the population is, I'm using my sample. Okay, so that's where this whole function comes from. It's just essentially a ratio of our variances. Okay. <laughs> I want to write a note down okay, that some books, and also um, it's also equally acceptable. We'll do both when um, we talk about it. Oh, I'm getting some wind here, blowing things around. Some books really simplify this. Our book is very exact. This is a calculus based course, so we tend to be very exact. It's meant for scientists and engineers so that you really understand like the details behind everything so that you can create better algorithms or better ways to implement it, okay? But some books that um, simplify this, um, degrees of freedom, when our variances are different, um, as the smaller of, I'm gonna take my n minus one and M minus one. I've got my two samples, N and M. That's my quantities from X, my quantities from Y. I get the degrees of freedom for X. I get the degrees of freedom for Y. I subtract one. I get the smaller of the two. And that's going to give me a simplified version of my degrees of freedom. Um, this is, these are fine to use. Um, I know um, on the final exam in previous years, you know, some instructors just taught this version here. Okay. You're going to see this on your formula sheet right, your calculation of R for our degrees of freedom, our rho, which is the ratio of the variances, okay. This part here, right, it comes from our textbook, which like I said, is tends to be more exact for scientists and engineers. So I'm going to do my examples using this variable here. You can check it with the um, easier version. Your results should come out fairly similar. We'll sh I'll show you the um, example using both. Um, remember, if you're not sure, you know, if your variances are the same, you can do a chi-squared test. Right? So if I do a chi-squared test on the variances of my samples, right, and I get that they're significantly different, then I'm going to do this version here, okay, this t, um, this t test when the population variances are not equal. Okay, if my chi-squared test says, you know, <coughs> statistically speaking at the same alpha level as what we're testing, statistically speaking, these variances are basically the same, then you can use your, your pooled version. The math tends to simplify down. Does everybody, do you need, anybody need more time here before I um, turn the page? Wait, so are we going to be using the formula that the book gives or the, the other way? Yeah, I'm, I tend to use this one, right, because um, this is a calculus-based course and we tend to be more exact. Also because you're basically science and engineering majors and so you want to be more exact about things and calculate out your degrees of freedom. So my examples, right, I'm using this one. 
I'm telling you though, when you read it in a book or if you read it elsewhere, even on some other solution set, these are the degrees of freedom because um, some people are using a more simplified version, okay? You're gonna get an answer that's like very, very similar, okay? But because, you know, like I say, because we're science and engineer, engineering people, right? And our book is geared towards science and engineering people and calculus based, and this is a much more exact version. This is the one that I'm gonna be using here. Okay. Now, but I'm letting you know so that when you read it elsewhere, you don't go, where does this come from, right? Anybody need more time to write all this stuff down? Okay. All right, <clears throat> I'm pulling out my lecture examples again. All right, so let's do this. Let's go back to that um, example that we just did. But now we're gonna assume that the variances are unequal and see how, um, how or if it changes, right? So the alpha is the same level. We wanna to check to see if the means are different. Okay, so I'm gonna start writing things down again. So my hypothesis is this. Means are the same versus the alternative hypothesis, the means are not the same. Okay, so this is what we're checking here. So our test statistic, that we need to check. We're going to calculate first our degrees of freedom. So I'm going to use um, rho, my r, to calculate that. So my r is equal to, let's write down the formula first, s of x squared all over n plus s of y squared all over m. This whole thing, quantity squared, divided by my variance divided by that squared plus my variance divided by the quantity squared divide, oops, sorry, not that part. Um, this one divided by n minus one, n minus one. There's no um, combination there. Okay, so let's put things in. So this is, I'm gonna fill, start filling in the blanks based on the same data that we had before. So this is 20.1 squared all over 34 plus 12.2 squared all over 29, that whole thing. Watch out for your order of operations. I tend to do these in stages where I'll, you know, square this out, divide it, and I'll square this out, divide it, I'll add these two, and then I'll square these. So I won't put them all in, in the same line on my calculator, because when I do that, sometimes my calculator doesn't do what I want it to do. All right, so 20.1 squared divided by 34 squared divided by 33 plus, 12.2 squared divided by 29 squared divided by 28. Okay, so be careful when you're doing this, especially come up with your numerator number, come up with a denominator number, and then divide them through. And then when I do this, I'm going to get my degrees of freedom. I got 55.5, which I then round down to 55. And we're not rounding up anymore like we did with our n values. This is I can round it down. It's fine. So that's my degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so r equals 55. Okay, my t, right, for my test statistic, x bar minus y bar, that's our sample, minus our null hypothesis all over, right, where this is assuming that these things are different, so I have to take each into account. Okay, so I'm going to plug in these variables here. So 105.5 minus 90.9. Minus zero. We, we always round down for degree of freedom. You can round down, yeah. <clears throat> and we round up no matter what it is. We do the ceiling function on the n because we're looking for like a quantity of values, right? So if I get, you know, um, from my n, I get, you know, uh, 30.1. Well, I'm going to round up to the next whole number because I've got 30 and a bit. So I need to calculate out the quantity that I'm getting needs to be an integer. Here, I'm just going to round down. And, and we'll find it's it's not too too important if you're off by one degree of freedom, but like that's why rounding down is just fine. Um, 20.1 squared all over 34 plus, oops, sorry, 12.2 squared all over 29 and square rooted. Okay, and this is going to give me a test statistic of 3.53. That's my test statistic. <coughs> so good. And now I need to find my critical value. That's where I'm going to use my degrees of freedom. Three. Critical value. 
Okay, so what I have is my degrees of freedom equals 55, that comes from here, right? And I've got alpha over two. My alpha was 0 0.05, so my alpha over two is 0 0.025, okay? So now my T of 0 0.025 and 55 degree of freedom, I look on my T table for degree of freedom 55 with the probability 0 0.025, and I'm going to get my t values. It's two tail, so I've got plus or minus 2.0041 okay, for my t value. All right, so now I need to make a decision. I have to compare my critical value to my test statistic. Okay, so our decision. So let's take a look. Our test statistic, which was 3.53, is greater than the positive part of our critical value, which is 2.0041. Oops, for one. Therefore, it's in the critical region. Therefore, I can reject the null hypothesis. Watch out for your um, analysis on here. It was really painful when I graded some of your quizzes. Some of you guys, you had everything set up perfectly, but then you wrote 3.53 is less than 2.041. And 3.53 is not less than 2.04. It's greater than, right? Which means I'm going to reject. But if you write that it's less than, then you're not going to reject. So be careful. Look at your numbers, right? That's why sometimes you want to draw a picture, right? So if I draw a picture with my difference in means, my null hypothesis here says our mu of x minus mu of y. That's our difference in means. So I've got these critical regions. So this is um, our critical value minus 2.0041, positive 2.0041. This area here is 0 0.025, 0 0.025. Okay. Our test statistic 3.53 falls right about here. Okay, which is well within our critical region. So draw a picture if you're not sure, right? So that means, right, we can say, okay, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis, right? That means that the means, these two, mu of x and mu of y, are, are statistically different from each other, okay? Okay, so far so good? Anybody need more time to keep writing? No? All right. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, another example. Okay. So this one says, um, example three, says we've got profits and profitability. We're going to measure the percent return on equity. We've got 12 companies. Okay, X are our large scale companies and Y are our small scale companies. Here's our data from each. Um, our large scale companies and small scale companies equally profitable based on here, this is our percent return on equity and our alpha is at the 0 0.05 level. Okay, so basically I've got two different sample groups. One is a large scale company. It's measured by typically either, um, you know, quantity of employees or usually how much output they're producing, you know, um, and then a small scale company, they've got some kind of threshold. Okay, so now what we need to do is <laughs> we have to do some um, analysis, right? So let's do our hypothesis and then we'll talk about the rest of it. Hypothesis, right? So our hypothesis is going to be that the means are equal to each other versus our null hypothesis that the means are not equal to each other, okay? Because they just said, are they equally profitable, which is the same thing as saying, are they the same or are they different, okay? So to calculate out our test statistic, I have to do some work ahead of time, right? I have to calculate the means, I have to calculate the sample standard deviations and the variances. Okay, so I have to calculate the means. Okay, which, you know, in this case, I'm just gonna add them all up and divide by the, the quantity that I have, okay? So I'm basically gonna get X bar. These are our sample means, X bar is 18.6 and our y bar is equal to 21.9, okay? All I did was, if you want, you can, in your calculators, um, I don't have my calculator here, in your calculators, you can enter in data on a table, right? And then you can do statistics. There's like a stat function. You can do statistics where like, 
your you know, ask, ask them to calculate the mean, ask to calculate the standard deviation, other stuff like that. Because we're going to calculate the mean on my different populations, um, I have to calculate the variances. on the different samples. So I've got S sub X. I calculated these offlines. This is 115.993. Y, 35.9. Oops. 0.7604. 35.9. Okay, so I've calculated the variances, calculated the means. I did this offline, so we don't have to calculate it right in front of everybody. And now we're going to use our means and our variances, right? So we're going to calculate our degrees of freedom. Okay, next part. So I'm going to use the row calculation. So this is, let's write it down again, s of x squared plus s of y squared over m. <clears throat> okay, we're doing a ratio of our variances. Okay, so let's plug, our, plug in our values. So this is 115.993. Um, all over 12. Now be careful, right? This is our variance. It's already squared. So be careful, don't square 115 already. Um, plus 35.7604 all over 12. And add these together. And then I'm going to square the result. Okay. Now I get to do it individually. So 115.993 divided by 12 squared divided by 11. 35.7604 divided by 12 divided by 11. <clears throat> okay, so watch out. Like I said, I've always been saying, be very careful about your math because um, you, you don't want to goof up on this part. So this is 17.194, um, which I'm going to use 17 as my degree of freedom. Okay, now we're going to calculate out our test statistic. Which is the whole point of this part, right? <clears throat> but I needed to calculate the mean, the variance, and the degrees of freedom first before I could calculate my test statistic. All right, so my test statistic, let's write down our formula. So t is going to equal to x bar minus y bar minus our null hypothesis. It doesn't matter whether we calculate our critical value or test statistic first. No. Now, I know in the previous sections, we've been calculating the critical value first before we do this. Critical value is just like looking it up in the table. Um, but although I guess in this case, we should calculate this part out first because we need the degree of freedom for the critical value. So um, I guess in this, because here we have to do the degree of freedom, you might as well calculate the test statistic first because you're already kind of there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm not even going to write minus zero anymore. 115.993 divided by 12 plus 35.7604 divided by 12. This is all square rooted. Okay, so I get my test statistic as minus 0 0.928. <clears throat> I get to do the critical value. All right, three. The critical value. Boxer and these. Okay. And keep it straight. All right, so our critical value, next step, right? So our degrees of freedom equals 17. I'm going to use that when I look up on my table. This is a two tailed test. All right, so I'm looking at alpha over 2 which is um, 0 0.025, right? So my T value, 0 0.025, degrees of freedom, 17. That's how we usually write it. And I'm looking up those lines. This row, this column, okay, gives me a test statistic plus or minus 2.1098 from the table. Okay, just incidentally, I'll write this in a different color. Um, put it in pencil. Um, if I do the degree of freedom as um, N minus one, right? If I do N minus one, or m minus one, I'm going to get my degree of freedom equal to 11. Okay, and if I look up a t statistic 0 0.025 comma 11, right, the test statistic that I get from that is 2.201. So 
So it's not remarkably different, 2.1 to 2.201, right? It's, that's why, you know, oftentimes you can like kind of do this as a, a hedge. Like if you check this out, like if I subtract, you know, these two and I check it out, is my T value pretty close, right? So if you're getting some really whacked out number of degrees of freedom here between the two, okay? Um, then maybe you should go back and check your math because maybe, you know, you goofed up in the, this, you know, kind of really busy calculation, okay? But just to show you how this is the other book version, you're not gonna get a T statistic that's remarkably different. Okay, so we've got our critical value. This is our two-tailed test, so let's just draw a really quick picture, right? So this is our T value. That puts us into the critical region, minus 2.1, positive 2.1. And this is um, our null hypothesis, which says that mu of x minus mu of y equals zero. Okay. But when I go to compare it to my um, test statistic, let's write this down here in our decision. Okay, so let's compare our critical value and our test statistic. So let's write it down. So our test statistic minus 0 0.928. Um, is greater than the critical value of the negative portion of our critical value minus 2.1098 but less than less than our positive critical value positive 2.1098 right so our test statistic right is like right around here okay so this is minus 0.9 right there okay which means right what do you think is it's not in the critical region i'm running out of space here so um fail to reject our null hypothesis which means based on the data i can't conclude that these two means are um actually uh different from one another okay i'm going to fail to reject i'm not accepting that they're equal but i'm not saying that they're different okay right here it's not, it's not within our critical region. Okay. And I kind of crammed it all in there. Anybody have questions so far? Anybody need a minute to keep writing? So now, take a look. So now what about when the population variances right our two population variances are known okay remember before we said um geez if we know what the variance is for the population that was the big trigger point whether i was going to use the z test or the t test so if i know what the population variances are okay or if i can say or when n and m are both really large like you know they're greater than 100 you know, we're approaching that z value right and we're just going to use the z test okay the z test really flips on whether or not you know your population variances, but let's write down what our z test is going to look like. So z is going to equal to same setup, x bar minus y bar minus our null hypothesis all over. And instead of my sample, I'm using my population, but I'm still normalizing it based on how much I have squared over m, right? Because I may have different quantities for n and m, and I have to take into account that I've got these two different samples. They each have their own population size, that's N and M. Okay, so I have to normalize, okay, based on that. Okay, so this is our Z test. This is when our population variances are known. Okay. okay. You guys are ready? We'll take a look at example. Uh, one second. Four. Okay, we'll take a look at example four when you're ready.
Okay, thank you. Okay, okay so example four says, <clears throat> We've got the hypothesis that the average number of sports that colleges offer for male students is greater than that offered for female students. A random sample of the number of sports offered by um, colleges is shown below. Okay, this is what we have here. Okay, at the alpha 0 0.10 level, so it's kind of a high alpha, but we're rolling with it. Is there enough evidence to support the claim? Now we're going to assume, look, this says we know the population variance. And we're going to assume that the population variances are equal at 3.3. Okay, so not only do we know what they are, but we um, are using that. All right, so now I've got the mean and the quantity and the mean and the quantity for each group. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up um, how we usually do. We're going to label out our hypothesis, our test statistic, and all that. So the first part, our hypothesis. My hypothesis. My null hypothesis is that the means are equal to each other versus my alternative hypothesis, right? Now look, um, is greater than. So they're saying that the a number is greater than, which means I'm dealing with a one-tailed test. U sub x is greater than u sub y. This is our claim. Okay, so this is a one-tailed test. All right, my test statistic. I'm gonna calculate out. So let's write down, so my x bar is equal to 8.6, my mu sub x, is equal to 3.3. Remember, they gave this to us as a standard deviation, so be very careful when you go to do the variances, you have to square it, because we were given as, you have to look for that, because we're gonna try to trick you. And our y bar is equal to 7.9, and <clears throat> y equals 3.3, okay? So let's go ahead and calculate out our test statistics. So z is gonna equal x bar minus y bar minus our null hypothesis, minus y all over sigma squared all over n plus sigma y squared all over m square rooted. So let's plug in what we know, okay? The difference in the means, 8.6 minus 7.9 minus zero. I'm not gonna worry about writing that anymore. This I have to square, so 3.3. .3. Is it always minus zero? Yeah, that's our hypothesis, right? So our null hypo the way that I write this is that mu sub x minus mu sub y equals zero. Right, if they're equal to each other, that means this subtraction here, right, is equal to zero. So that's my null hypothesis. When I calculate out my test statistic, I'm testing it against the null hypothesis, right? The null hypothesis says that these two are okay. equal to each other. So that's why we don't have to worry about like, oh, where do those numbers go? And this, you know, I don't know what the population mean is, you know, it's okay because our null hypothesis says these two are equal, which means their subtraction is equal to zero. So that drops out when I calculate out my test statistic. Um, this is out of 50, we're given, yeah, good, plus 3.3 .3 squared out of 50. It looks like they have the same number in each. Don't forget to square root it, right? So I'm going to subtract these out. Don't forget to square, right, and then add things up. And I get 1.06 as my test statistic. Okay. Fill that up. Now we get to calculate out our critical value. Okay, so our critical value, this is um, greater than, so that makes it a right-tailed test, okay, which means that I'm going to say my mu sub x is greater than mu sub y. Okay, I'm going to just draw a quick picture because it helps me keep track. Okay, so my right-tailed test says, okay, so the null hypothesis says that mu sub x, the difference between them is zero, but what if, right, it's not? So what I'm going to do is my right-tailed test says that mu sub x is greater than mu sub y, which puts us on the positive end. This is our alpha, which is 0 0.1, they gave us that. It's a right-tailed test, I don't have to divide alpha by anything, okay? So I just need to be able to look that up. So, but in order to calculate out my z value and the probabilities, how I'm gonna get that, remember to do the right-tailed, I have to do the overall, this is one minus, this bit here, okay, because remember our z, right, gives us the probability of z less than some value, so if I want the probability of z greater than some value, I have to go one minus um, z less than that value. So for this, right, if this is 0.1, I'm looking at um, what's the value of z that's associated with 0.9, right, because if this is 0.1, this whole area here is equal to 0.9, so if the area, but the probability of z Right, if the probability of z less than some value is equal to 0.9, what's that z value? So that corresponds to um, 
1.285. That comes from my Z table. So I look up 0.9 on my Z table and I find 1.285. So Z equals 1.285. So let me just write that down. I look for Z equals 0 0.9 find the corresponding p value because 1 minus alpha equals p so 1 minus 0 0.1 equals 0 0.9 okay because we're doing greater than so i need to go 1 minus that to get this value okay um just incidentally i'll talk about um p value just um so that you guys can know how we would think about this with p value method so um so with the p-value, right? So I need to look up the p-value associated with our test statistic, which was um, z equals 1.06, right? And so that p-value that's associated with the z of 1.06 um, was equal to, and this is a right-tailed test, right? this is gonna be equal to one minus, probability that z is less than or equal to 1.06, which is 1 minus 0 0.8554, which our p-value becomes p equals 0 0.1446, right? Because this is right-tailed, so be very careful, right? You have to keep in track. You're right-tailed, left-tailed, two-tailed, how am I going to do that? So this is only a single-tailed test, right? So I'm just going to compare this to my alpha, which we'll do in just a second. So I've got my critical values. I've got my test statistic. I need to think about my decision. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, I'll draw this out. Um, yeah, okay, wait. So our test statistic, 1.06 is less than our critical value, which is 1.285. Okay, so if this is 1.285, right, and our um, test statistic right here, 1.06. You can think about in terms of p-values, right? So my p-value is gonna be the area from this value here, 1.06, all the way off, right? All the way up to the infinity here. Because that p-value region, p-value is an area under the curve, because that region is bigger than my alpha, right? That's what it means graphically. That area is bigger than my alpha, what are we gonna do? So if the test statistic is less than the critical value, which puts it outside of our critical region, therefore failed to reject our null hypothesis. Okay, let's check a look at our p-values. So our p-value, right, is greater than our alpha. So this is, um, our p-value is 0 0.1446, and our alpha was 0 0.1. Okay, sorry, can't see that. Right, so this is our failed to reject. So there's not enough evidence, let's write it down. Not enough evidence to support the claim that colleges offer, I guess you that more words to male students. Okay, our alpha value was, you know, uh, fairly fairly high, you know, but it still looks like it's not going to be um, significantly different based on the data, okay? This is a population variance, population values, right? But even though we knew what the population variance was for some reason, we were given that, right? So that's what we worked with, okay? We did our Z. So these things I looked up on my Z table, not on my T table. So be careful. There's no degree of freedom on here. So if you're, if you're doing this, right, and you're thinking, I'm going to be working with the Z because I know what the population variance is, right? Then um, and you're looking at the t table and you go now what degree of freedom do i use i don't have it that's kind of a clue that um you need to go to the z table right because you're dealing with the population okay all right and that's basically it for um chapter 9.2 which is looking at testing the means the differences between two means okay of two different populations all right so what i can do here is i will